Okay, so today we're going to talk about Fourier optics and diffraction again. Uh, last time I spent a lot of time talking about properties of the Fourier transform, both in one dimension, which we used for interferometers, and in your homework, you're going to do some stuff with sound, and in two dimensions, which are uh, it's appropriate for images and for propagation of light. And that's, that's what we're going to start talking about today, it's using the Fourier transform and using the fact that we know how plane waves evolve in time and space to ask how do arbitrary patterns of light, which you can write as a sum of plane waves via the Fourier transform, how, did that, how does that evolve in time and space? Um, okay, so let me just start with, with wave propagation. This is mostly a reminder of some early classes, wave propagation in homogeneous media. So this would be in air or in vacuum or even within, within glass or water. Um, and there are a couple of key points here. So Maxwell's equations are linear, that's one. Uh, we know how plane waves propagate. And I'll, I'll remind you how that, that works uh, next. Any function can be written as some combination of plane waves with the right coefficients. And so since all three of those things are true, since Maxwell's equations are linear and we, we know how plane waves propagate, we know how to write anything in terms of a sum of plane waves, we can uh, write our initial state as a sum of plane waves, propagate those plane waves, and then uh, write the, the sum back in position space, you know, maybe do, do the sum. And, and so the first process of writing some initial configuration as a sum of plane waves, that's a Fourier transform. So you can think of, uh, I guess the example you should have in mind is laser light hitting a, a hole or laser light hitting a little square hole. Um, you can write that, the, the state of the light at that square hole as a sum of plane waves. And of course they have to constructively interfere in the square and destructively interfere outside of the square. So there's some particular combination of plane waves that will do that. We calculate that with the Fourier transform. We propagate those plane waves forward it mostly just involves adding a phase. And then we, at, you know, depending on how far we want to propagate, we, uh, we, we go as far as we want, some, some z, and we can add in time dependence if we want, which just turns all the phases at some rate. Um, for, for today, we'll be dealing with monochromatic light, so all the phases get, get turned at the same rate. But uh, in general, uh, different colors have phases that turn at different rates. And then you write this new sum back in position space by doing the inverse Fourier transform. And uh, that, that's, that's just doing the, doing the sum. So if you write everything as a sum and at the end of the day you do the sum, you are, the, the process of writing initial state as a sum is the forward Fourier transform. And at the end of the process, the process of doing the, doing the sum and writing it as a simple function back in simple function of position is the inverse Fourier transform. So uh, let's, let's review all of those points here. So let me let me remind you how what, what Maxwell's equations in homogeneous media are and how we get the, the plane wave equation out of it. And uh, we've done this a couple of times, but I would say if there's one thing you take out of this class, it's what what do Maxwell's equations look like in this uh, in this notation where we where we define the d and the h vectors. So this is this is how you typically deal with Maxwell's equations in some media with some uh, some epsilon parameter that's not just the vacuum epsilon and some magnetic mu parameter that's not just the, uh, the vacuum parameter. You, you define these H and D vectors like this. And then Maxwell's equations just become Gauss's law, uh, the divergence of E in, in, uh, in free space where there are no free charges. Uh, this is zero. There are no magnetic monopoles free or not free. So the divergence of H is always zero. Um, the curl of E it has to do with the rate of change of the time derivative of H. Should be a negative here. This is Faraday's law. And finally, Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction is that the curl of H is plus epsilon uh, D partial E partial T. 
So when you write Maxwell's equations with this notation, everything looks a little bit more symmetric. It's just you have to keep track of four, four different things, which are two of which are related with this constant that's epsilon naught times some small factor that depends on how uh, how the media works and and uh, B and H are related by mu naught times some small order one constant that that has to do with how the the magnetic uh, mostly the spins and the, and the orbits of the material interact. Uh, okay, so in order to get the wave equation, you can either take the curl of this one or take the curl of that one. Either way will give us what we want. Since we want, since we're usually dealing with the equation for the electric field and we let the magnetic field go along for the ride, we'll take the curl of this first equation. So curl of, oops, curl of the curl of the curl of E is minus mu partial partial T. So the partial derivatives commute and the curl is just a bunch of partial derivatives. Curl of H. Okay, um, now we use a vector calculus identity here. This is just true for any, any field. It does not have anything to do with the fact that this is an electric field. The curl of a curl you can write as the gradient of the divergence of E uh, minus the Laplacian of E. And on this side, we will use Ampere's law here and substitute in this time derivative here. So this gives us minus mu epsilon um, two derivatives of E. And of course, the part that does depend on electromagnetism is that this divergence vanishes if you're if, if you're in a region with no free charges. So either vacuum or uh, inside of glass where there are bound charges on the atoms. But all the effect of those bound charges um, is already captured in, in this epsilon here. So this is going to go to zero for, for, uh, for no, no, free, no free charges. And, and that gives us the, the wave equation. So the minus minuses cancel out and mu mu times epsilon, this is one over C squared, not the speed of light in vacuum squared, but the speed of light in whatever media you happen to be using. And if I write Maxwell's equations um, in terms of the, the wave speed, it's just two derivatives of E with respect to time equals C squared times the uh, Laplacian. Let me not write the vector symbol here. Often the Laplacian is not written with a vector symbol just because it is a scalar. After you square it, it is a scalar. Uh, Laplacian squared of, of E. And there are many solutions to this equation, including the standing waves in a cavity. But the simplest solutions are plane wave solutions. And those look like this, E, e of R and T equal epsilon naught, uh, some, some constant out front that gives you the vector, um, E to the I K dot R minus I omega T. And in order for this to satisfy the equation, you plug this in, there has to be some relationship between the omegas and the k's, and let's ask what what our what our free parameters are here. So um, we we might start out thinking that we have k b being k k sub x, k sub y, and k sub z. We have a different coefficient multiplying each of the x, y, and z components here. Um, and I write the magnitude of k. This is just the square root of k x squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. And if I if I plug this into this equation, this Laplacian pulls down an, an i k and it pulls out another i k. And that gives me a, a k squared here. And the two time derivatives pull down a minus i omega and a minus i, uh, another minus i omega. And that gives me a, an, an omega squared. And then uh, this E is, is the same on both sides of the equation, so that can cancel out. And then we get a relationship between the magnitude of k and omega. And that relationship is just that omega equals speed of light 
times the magnitude of k. And uh, for a particular color of light, say if you're shining a helium neon laser through, through one of these uh, square holes, which, which will be an, an example that, that we'll go through, um, omega is fixed. That, that's just fixed by the, the color of the oscillation. And the wavelength of light is fixed. And the wavelength, so how, how far you have to go such that this complex exponential goes through a full two pi cycle, that, that the relationship there is that k is two, two pi over lambda. So when, when the distance advances by lambda, k dot that distance advances by a full two pi. Okay, so this is sort of the overview of, of all the definitions of plane waves. This is a solution to Maxwell's equations, but since Maxwell's equations are linear, any linear combination of these solutions is also a solution to Maxwell's equations. So, uh, so in terms of sort of free parameters, if, if, we're, if we're doing diffraction with, with a laser, lambda is fixed. That's, that's just fixed by the wavelength of, of the laser. The magnitude of K is fixed. Um, and that fixes the, the omega, fixes the oscillations per second. Uh, but just because the magnitude of K is fixed, we could divide that magnitude up however we want between the X, Y, and Z components. So there are, uh, there are two, two free parameters that are just directions of where this wave is propagating. And, and we can think about it literally as fixing the, the magnitude and saying that our two free parameters that, that are consistent with this, this solution are, uh, are two polar angles, say. Or today we're going to say, we're going to uh, talk about the free parameters a little bit differently. We're going to say that the wave is mostly going in the z direction. Right? You have a laser that's shining on a, on, a piece of, uh, on a piece of metal with a square hole cut out. Uh, it's mostly going in, in the z direction, but there's some, some x and y components. And so we're going to take our free parameters as the x and y components. And once we can pick, as long as our x and y components are less than the total magnitude k, which is fixed by the color, as long as, as, long as each one is less, um, well, as, as, long as, the, as long as these are less, then uh, you can pick kx, you can pick ky, and you can solve for kz. So we'll take kx and ky as free parameters that, that have some range of, of uh, where they're valid up, up, to, up to kx squared plus ky squared is, is the magnitude of, of k squared set by the wavelength. And we'll let kz be determined by uh, the freedom that we've chosen from kx and ky and just solving for kz with, with this, this equation, knowing the wavelength. So, we're going to start out with two two free parameters, and let me let me just draw sort of what what that looks like. So let me start drawing some pictures here. I'll uh, give myself lots of room up here. All right, so any any questions about the kind of lightning review of Maxwell's equations, how to get the wave equation, and plane plane wave solutions? which we will now examine in a little bit more detail and then we will start taking superpositions of. So this, this topic, this diffraction topic is a topic that we could have covered much earlier. A lot of the topics in, the, in optics, once you get past the basic Maxwell stuff, um, a lot of the topics are pretty independent. Uh, I was following the order of the book mostly just for for our convenience, in case the book referred back to previous results. Um, the one thing I did switch was I switched the, the coherent stuff where we have a lot of different colors of light uh, with, with the diffraction stuff where we typically have one color of light, but uh, a lot of different directions. And the reason I did that was because the coherent stuff is typically a one dimensional, involves one dimensional Fourier transforms and sums of one dimensional waves. And the diffraction stuff involves uh, two dimensional Fourier transforms sums of two-dimensional waves. So I, I figured uh, just conceptually it'd be a little, a little easier to start, especially once we start doing numerical stuff, uh, which will happen on the homework. It's easier to understand how the Fourier transforms work numerically 
in Python or in any any language, it's basically all the same uh, in in one dimension and then generalize that to two dimensions. But uh, there's nothing there's nothing that relies on on the last several weeks here. Okay, so um, let's let's just ask what it means to fix you know to choose kx and ky freely. So if I choose kx and ky, here's kx, here's ky. Um, they can be positive or negative. They can be anywhere they want. I'm going to choose. Let's just have an example where it's sort of mostly ky and a little bit of kx. All right, what does that look like in terms of the plane wave? Well, this means that uh, in, in terms of position, actual x and actual y, this means that I have a plane wave uh, whose peaks and troughs are, oh, and, not, and I'm, I'm just like uh, slicing, Let, let's say, uh, let's say I draw this uh, at kz equals zero. So I'm just drawing this in the in the kz equals zero plane. Here I'm just drawing this at at z equals zero here. So I'm drawing this in the z equals zero plane. So so I'm not I'm not worried about kz. So yes, I could solve for kz. It will do that next. Just what does this look like in the x y plane in terms of phases? And let's let's just also say at t equals zero, just just so we can ignore this term. So now we just have e to the i kx x plus ky y. And if I were to plot that, that would be a plane wave whose, uh, whose kind of direction of motion is up. Uh, let me just make sure I'm sort of have the angles right. So the direction of motion is in the direction of the k vector. And so the peaks and troughs are, are uh, perpendicular to that. And the, the separation between these peaks and troughs is, is not lambda because I'm only taking a, I'm only looking at, at z equals zero. If I were to draw the full three-dimensional plane wave and I were to ask where are the planes of, of peaks and troughs, then the separation would be lambda. But uh, you can imagine that if I, uh, if I have a, a plane wave that's going 100% in the z direction, where kx and ky are zero, as I shrink this vector down to zero, these peaks and troughs separate further and further and further. And that just means that um, if I have a, have a bunch of planes separated by wavelength lambda, I could, I could tilt, them, tilt them up to give them some kx, I could tilt them sideways to give them some ky, or I could just keep them going straight, straight ahead. And there's no kx and no ky, and at z equals zero, at t equals zero, there's just a single, uh, you know, all, all x and y would just all be a single phase, and all of the interesting action would happen in z. So, so x and y is pretty arbitrary, as long as it's less than less than some some circle whose radius is is k. Um, I can pick any any kx and any ky within that circle, and and there's a there's an appropriate kz that goes along with that. All right, so so what does this look like in in a different projection? So so this is this is example one. Let's let's look at uh, example two. So I'll, I'll pick a simpler example for for this. So here I'll draw kx, ky, and I'm just going to have have the vector go totally in the y direction, no, no x direction. So this is taking the laser beam and tilting it up slightly so that uh, it's still mostly going straight in the z direction, but it's going a little bit up in the y direction. Uh, that in position space, that would in, well, in x and y for, for, z, for z equals zero and t equals zero, that would correspond to, to peaks and troughs going like this, but, let me draw. Let me draw what this looks like. Oh, oops! Why did I just erase that? I'm at c equals zero, t equals zero. All right. Let me just draw that uh, over here. Sorry, this wasn't super well worked out. So, example two. Uh, let me just draw that in the 
eine z in the zy plane zy plane so k ky is something uh, kz is the rest of the amount and usually kz ends up being bigger so let me just draw it like this so here kz is going in this direction and if i were to draw the the positions here so the z position and the y position for example too there would be a plane wave that's it's going mostly in the z direction, but a little bit up in the y direction. Of course, this plane wave, these things extend out to infinity. So, so here the plane wave is, is tilted slightly up from going straight ahead in the laser. And uh, in order, if, if I shine a laser, so we saw that whenever we made a laser beam, it, it has some finite width. So no matter how big you make the laser beam, it's never truly a plane wave. But the bigger you make it, the more it looks like a plane wave. Uh, and same thing when you have a laser beam, if you spread it out and you make it nice and uniform, it looks pretty pretty plane wave-like in its center. And then you have it hit an aperture, like a small, small circular hole or a small square hole. And in order to ask what is the state of that wave at z equals zero, it cannot be composed only of plane waves going in the z direction anymore, even though the thing that hit it is pretty pretty close to a plane wave that's going in the z direction. Once it hits the aperture, um, if it were composed just of a plane wave going in the z direction, it would have uh, infinite infinite extent. Right? These these planes go go on and on forever. So uh, in order to construct what happens at the at the aperture when the laser hits the hits the uh, metal with the little square cut out of it, we have to have a sum of plane waves that are slightly slightly off axis. And then we can work out exactly what that sum is. So, so this, this is a snapshot here. Uh, let's say that this is at, at x equals 0 and at t equals 0. And if I were to let time advance, what you would see is you would see all these, these uh, wave fronts move, move forward in, in time. So the, the place where, say the place where it's purely real and positive, that, that peak of the, of the complex waves cosine, that peak moves, moves forward in time uh, in this direction. Uh, okay, so, so let's actually uh, talk about the recipe of, of how, to get, how to get the propagation of some arbitrary function and next time we'll plug in a bunch of specific examples that are uh, kind of the ones that uh, that we'll we'll examine in in the lab. So ones that we can solve analytically, and ones that you'll simulate on on homework. So you'll, you'll solve them analytically, and then you'll simulate them numerically, and then we'll do some tweaks that you can still do numerically, but you can't you can no longer do easily analytically. Um, I think, yeah, I'll, next time I'll maybe talk about the advantages and disadvantages of doing numerical stuff versus analytic stuff. Okay, so, so what is the recipe? Recipe for, for propagating things forward in, in, uh, in space. So let's say, you you start out you know you know this you know e say that just the positive the, the plus component so this is the the coefficient here you know this I should put a plus here you know this at x and y and at z equals zero so this is like when the laser beam hits the hits the square hole you know that. Uh, as a function of x and y, it's it's some uh, non-zero constant in the square hole and some zero constant, well, zero outside of the square hole at, at z equals zero. That's the plane where we'll say it hits the hole. Um, you say you know this and you want to write this as a sum of plane waves. So minus infinity to infinity, dkx over two pi, minus infinity to infinity, 
dKy over 2 pi. Um, in reality, these, these integrals are, are going to be 0 beyond some point, but I we don't have to explicitly specify that. We can just make the coefficients here 0 beyond some point. So e, e plus tilde, let's call this the 2D Fourier transform, because this only depends on kx and ky e to the i. You know, this is only a function of x and y. I fixed, I fixed z equals 0. So the 2D Fourier transform of this is only a function of kx and ky. e to the i, kx, x plus i, ky, y. All right, so, so calculating this, uh, calculating this, so writing this as a sum of, of plane waves with these coefficients, calculating the coefficients is the, the forward, forward Fourier transform. So you could either, um, well, there's many ways of doing that. Uh, numerical was one of them, just projecting out each of the plane waves is another way of doing it. Um, okay, so what is, the, what is the problem we're solving? We, we know this function. What else are we given? We're given, given the wavelength. So we know the wavelength of the helium neon laser. Um, and therefore we're given K, the, the magnitude of the, of the uh, k vector. Um, and this, this means that we know that uh, 2 pi over lambda squared, this is k squared. This is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. Um, this allows us to solve for kz. Uh, and let's see, I can probably fit it here. This allows us to solve for kz for, for each of these, there's some kx and some ky. And once I know kx and ky, and I know k squared, because I know lambda, I can solve for kz. This is the, the square root of, um, well, let me just write a 2 pi over lambda squared minus k x squared minus k y squared. OK. And, and what we know is that all of these plane waves, the, the valid plane wave solutions to Maxwell's equations are, are ones where, uh, where the relationship between kx, ky, and kz is this. And, and so uh, since, since we know for, for all of the non-zero kx and ky's, we know what kz has to be based on the wavelength, we can now just write what the solution is for, for all z. And you'll see why that where that comes from in a second. So let me erase that. So this, this allows us to, to know the electric field just at one position at, at z equals zero for any x and y and write it for any any other position that's that's uh, propagating forward. So, all right, let's see. So, so we, we can, okay, so, so, uh, I'm probably gonna run out of room. E plus for X and Y and any Z now, this is it's still, all this stuff is still the same. It's just now we know the Z dependence. So minus infinity, infinity dkx over 2 pi minus infinity, infinity dky over 2 pi. Same, same coefficients, e tilde plus 2d kx ky. And now we have e to the i. I want to desperately wanted to keep this. So. e to the i kx x plus i ky y plus i kz z, where, where kz is, is now just given by kx and ky. 
So uh, this, if we plug in z equals zero, right, we recover our our starting point because there, there was no uh, kz z here. But since each of these waves is a valid solution to Maxwell's equations with some arbitrary coefficient, the arbitrary coefficients will be determined by the initial conditions or the, the z equals zero conditions. And since Maxwell's equations are linear, any superposition of these waves that satisfy Maxwell's equations, because they have the right relationship between kx and ky and kz, uh, any superposition of these waves is also a solution. So here's where we're taking the superposition. And each of the waves is weighted by a complex weight that we determine just at, at z equals zero. And this will allow us to, to propagate uh, propagate things forward in time. Or, well, in, not in time, in, uh, in z. So if you're shining a laser light on, on, uh, on a square at, at t equals zero, you can work out what these coefficients are. You can extend it to all z. And if you want to extend it to all time, you just multiply by e to the minus i omega t. And that just makes the whole, whole static pattern uh, rotate in phase. And it just that just looks like the whole static pattern is moving forward. All right, so let me, let me rewrite this in a slightly different way. And uh, let me see if I, I'll, I'll have a little bit more room if I start back here. So minus infinity to infinity dkx over two pi minus infinity to infinity dky over two pi. Now let me group the terms slightly differently. Let me take all of this stuff, e tilde plus 2d kx ky. And let me take the ikz term, e to the i. Um, so kz of z. And then what's left over is just e to the i kxx plus i ky. Why? Okay, so why did I why did I pull this out? Well, now this is the expression for the uh, the inverse Fourier transform. So, so we take the forward Fourier transform of of our initial pattern to get these coefficients, and we multiply each of those coefficients by some phase factor that depends on the kx and the ky of that particular one. So, so the, the one right at the, right at the origin where kx and ky equals zero, this just, uh, this gets multiplied by uh, uh, kz that's just two pi over lambda. And as you get farther and farther away from the origin, they get multiplied by phase factors that are uh, smaller and smaller factors of z. That's fine. So we've taken the Fourier trans forward transform to get, get these numbers. That's just the definition of what, what these numbers are. Um, we multiply each of those numbers by a simple phase. And then in order to, to back out the, uh, the function for any x and y and z, all we need to do is take the inverse Fourier transform of this. So, so this, this thing in parentheses, this is the new, the new, E plus 2d, but for for any any z, not just z equals zero. Right? If I plug in z equals zero, I recover what I started with. But now this this applies for any z, um, and with the proper kx here, we know that this satisfies the Maxwell's equations. Uh, okay. So and then and then to when, once you have this and you've multiplied, you inverse for a transform which is what this, the rest of this equation is, you inverse Fourier transform to get the, the, uh, the function for any x, y, and z. So that, that will be the, the procedure, the recipe that we'll follow. Um, so let me, I think that's the end of the content for today. Um, Next time I, I will 
show you some numerical examples and then do some analytic calculations. Uh, and on your homework, you will do the same thing. You will maybe not do new analytic calculations, but at least use the analytic calculations we do in class and uh, do the numerical examples. So, so if all we were ever gonna do were numerical, numerical examples and stuff, we're basically done. We can, we can start off with any arbitrary pattern at, at z equals zero, tell Python to take the forward Fourier transform to get these coefficients, take each of those coefficients and multiply by the right phase factor, that's easy to do, um, to, to, to ask what does the pattern look like at a particular z, and then tell Python to do the inverse Fourier transform, which is this, the rest of the sum. And that will give us our, our, uh, our electric field at some, some arbitrary point in z. Now, given that we can do that, we can, have, we can ask Python to do that pretty quickly. Why would we even bother doing analytic stuff? Well, uh, there's, there's always a couple of reasons to, to do things analytically. One is uh, whenever you do anything numerically, you wanna make sure that uh, if you plug in something where you know the answer, the, the numerical calculation gives you, gives you the right thing. Also, there's very little intuition in this. So it's super easy when you're doing numerical stuff to, uh, to, to do something really dumb, like um, have, so, so you have to, set your, uh, have to set your matrix size to be the right size. So, so right, we have our, our E of X and Y and say we set it to be you know, two, two millimeters by two millimeters and we have a square hole that's one millimeter by one millimeter in the center. Uh, that, that seems like that should be big enough. And we go through this whole procedure and we ask, what does the field look like at, at Z equals one meter? Well, the field at Z equals one meter is gonna be way bigger than our, our two millimeter by two millimeter square. So uh, that's gonna screw us up. Oh, my battery is about to die. Uh, why, didn't, why didn't it get plugged in? Well, that, that's okay, I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to end anyway. Um, and so having an analytic answer allows you to predict, okay, how big do I need to make this square? Even though it seems excessively big for the initial conditions, um, as, I, as I go to farther and farther z, I need to make the square big enough to, to see. And that's the kind of thing where analytic, analytic examples help, even, even, when you, uh, even when you want to end up doing things numerically. All right, so let me, let me take questions. Let me just stop the recording and grab my charger, and then I'll take questions. So if you have to go, uh, go ahead. But uh, let me let me grab my charger.